All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for attending. This is going to be our last session of Wolfcon. We've had a great week, and um, I'm looking forward to this session. So um, just a couple of reminders that we are recording. Uh, you can also find the uh, closed captioning under the live transcripts at the bottom of the Zoom. Uh, use the hashtag Wolfcon21 for all your social media tweeting. And then uh, the Q&A is also available. And so um, use that for any questions that you have. And with that, I will pass it over to Peter. Wonderful. Thank you, Beth. Uh, so this last session of the day is a, a panel, uh, Strategies for Reducing Barriers to uh, Adopting Open Source. Uh, and with me today are three people, uh, Deborah Howell, uh, who is the Director of IT Operations at Cornell University, Doug Hahn, uh, the Director of Library Applications and Integration at Texas A&M University, and Mike Gorell, uh, Director of Operations at Index Data. So in case anyone is wondering where all the directors are, uh, they are on this call. Uh, so we're going to just have a, a conversation here, the, the, the four of us. Uh, I encourage you to uh, use the question and answer feature in Zoom uh, to put in your own questions and comments, and I will reflect them back to the panelists. Uh, but to get us uh, started in this conversation, um, let's start with, uh, for each of you, uh, Doug, Deborah, and Mike, uh, why do you find uh, open source attractive to your organization? Well, since you said my name first, I guess I'll go first. Um, and for Texas A&M University, um, I guess we've always just enjoyed the aspect of collaboration with other institutions, uh, other peer institutions, or just anyone that's working on stuff that we like and we want to join. And so uh, we've always had a really uh, initiative towards open source. Uh, the other thing is we recognize that we are a larger institution with more resources. And because of this, we feel like we have an obligation to assist smaller institutions. And then ultimately, we just want to be in complete control because we're always special. We're, there's always something special. And so we want to be able to make that change if we need to. Uh, so there you go. That's me. Great. Uh, any thoughts, Deb? Yeah, I think, for, I think for Cornell, Deb is fine also. Uh, yep. I think for Cornell, you know, we've had past experience where we've been locked in with a vendor and unable to do what we need to do or want to do. They've not been responsive. Uh, it's that, you know, trying to turn the Titanic analogy. And with open source, you can be so much more agile while, you know, while maintaining the, the base source code so that you don't, you know, hamper your future upgrades. But it's really the ability to say, I need this thing or I want this thing. And if I can build it and share it with the community so that we can be good community partners as well, it just gives us flexibility. And I think those are the big ones for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For index data, you know, we've been working in open source software for many, many, many years, over 20 years, dating back to our uh, creation of uh, yeah, as, uh the Z 950 client. And I think it's, so open source has sort of become part of our DNA as a company. And we look for opportunities to contribute to high value add, high need areas. We also look though to um, work with institutions and other organizations that have aligned interests. Uh, we find that a uh, product development path that is based around open source sort of lowers some of the, the barriers between true collaboration that can often occur between a vendor and uh, a customer or a consumer. And so when we're all sort of on the same page and in, in sharing this open source shared uh, responsibility as well as, well as shared work, uh, we think that tends to, to create some special synergies and, and just a, a really good experience for everyone. We, as a business, um, 
our philosophy is really trying to create um, services, wrap services around open source platforms that can uh, fund our F development efforts in those uh, open source areas. So it, we're sort of in a weird, uh, in a good way, I guess, uh, company in that sense is we're not, uh, we don't look at uh, business models that that are, are aimed at giving us like huge revenue growth. We're, we're looking at business models that allow us to sustain ourselves so that we can continue to participate in these communities, which we love. It's, uh, I'm reflecting already in, in the title of, of this section, uh, it's, it's about reducing barriers. Uh, and and uh, Doug and Deborah, you, you've already talked in, in some respects about uh, how you view open source as uh, reducing barriers. Uh, uh, Doug, if, if you know you, if, if Texas A&M is special and, and that becomes a, a barrier, uh, that you have to do something and, and maintaining control. Uh, uh, and, and Deborah, uh, finding something that Cornell needs to do um, and then releasing that uh, uh, to the community. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of, of barriers that you've seen with um, either non-open source solutions or open source solutions that you've adopted uh, that you've then adapted to overcome some of those barriers. I, I guess I'll start off. The, the, the reducing barriers, are, it's like you commented on, they're so broad, the barriers are, are there. I mean, one of the biggest barriers uh, for collaboration is common ground on some sense. It's like everybody's just a little bit special. One of the reasons that we're in open sources so that we can make these changes. And, uh, you know, if we were gonna, you know, we wanna do something to collaborate with Cornell, you know, somebody's gotta give of, you know, maybe their business process. And that's, so that's a barrier to collaboration and, and you know, sharing code and, you know, the true goal of open source, I think. Um, some barriers that we have internally to the library or the, is, on some sense, just unrealistic expectations. You know, uh, a lot of people think if we pull open source off the shelf or use it, you know, it's going to be free or, you know, we can, we can do anything to it. But to make it do a lot of this stuff, there's a cost, whether it's just the coders on the keyboard or the maintenance or stuff like that, so. And as uh, Deborah, uh, you and perhaps Mike are reflecting, uh, if others uh, in uh, in the audience, the attendees, if if there's barriers that you've encountered, uh, put those into the Q and A, uh, and we'll reflect them reflect on them back here uh, uh, with the panelists. Oh, absolutely, I'm going to pick up where Doug left off, where he was talking about you know open source. Open source doesn't mean free, right? It, it, it means open, but open and free aren't the same thing, and so. In some cases, I, that's why I appreciate the Folio community actually, is because you can contribute in whatever way your institution is able, whether that's sitting on SIGs and providing subject matter experts or becoming a PO or contributing developer time or contributing actual dollars. And Cornell has done all of those things when it comes to Folio. We do have a very successful Blacklight implementation at Cornell and that's how we do our discovery. And I think one of the important things about open source is it helps to feed open access, which is really important to a lot of libraries and librarians. I'm convinced, I'm an IT person, but I'm convinced that librarians spend a lot of their time trying to foment insurrection everywhere. And so, and they're fierce and amazing and I love them and I love supporting them. And so that, the, that heart of open access and, and that, you know, that sort of foundation of open access. And so our Blacklight implementation, which is our discovery layer. And so part of that, getting access to things is discovery, you know, being able to find them and, and then pull them and, and share them with folks. So I think that's a, a great piece of um, open source and also reducing barriers is getting involved. And Blacklight has a rich community as well. Like I think Folio, 
is developing and I know it's definitely, you know, goals I've heard from the community council and the product council and everyone who participates is what does this future robust community look like? And so I think to continue to reduce barriers, we need to keep building that community and contributing in whatever ways we're able to. It doesn't always have to be dollars, although time translates to dollars. And I have one more thing to reduce barriers. I think it's also about putting some, I call them the navigational beacons. Uh, we get so with open source, we get so we can do, it's possible. We could, we can build this, we can do this, we could change this, we could customize this and we're special and we should customize it. But making sure that as we're implementing, we're putting processes and procedures in place to ensure that we don't so customize our specific implementation that we can't take advantage of future modules that the community produces or other institutions produce. That becomes uh, sort of a lock-in on its own. If, it if does. You know, we, we talk about open source as preventing vendor lock-in, but if you customize it, you, you effectively lock yourself in. You do. And um, Cornell has done that. Not in the library yet though, but uh, <laughs> it's necessary. I'm reminded of the saying, you broke it, you bought it. Yeah. So if you if you do some customization, then in a, in a way you, you kind of broke it uh, to fit your specific needs. That means you're, you may be responsible for maintaining it for as long as you need that functionality. When, when I think about barriers, I think about um, there's a couple of practical things that that are real. Um, there are technologies that are in play, languages that are that are used for certain open source projects. And so sometimes there can be a very practical barrier to contributing in a certain way. So if you don't have people on staff that are Java developers, for example, or Python developers, then you may not be able to contribute to any, any given project. But one of the things I think that's great about Folio um, and ReShare is a similar project in that, in that way is that there are uh, there are opportunities to contribute, participate, and benefit um, along the spectrum of, of all, all skill types and job types, and, you know, from subject matter expertise, uh, develop, DevOps, uh, certainly development, product ownership, um, fundraising. I mean, there's just all kinds of, of opportunity for people to participate and contribute. And so I think a lot of us feel like open source is... Um, is one of those altruistic uh, activities that we, you know, it's we're we're better because of our contributions, and the world is better because of our contributions. And so it's nice that there are different places for almost every individual to be able to contribute. And as the uh, person in in at, at least the folio community that manages uh, translations, uh, if you're bilingual uh, and want it to. Uh, contribute to the project with, with uh, translation efforts, yeah, come, come talk to me because uh, uh, I'll set you up. Uh, so we, we've, we've, already, we've talked about uh, um, how open source uh, is sometimes, it, it, it has this notion of free. Uh, and I think uh, at least as a, a library community We've gotten past the the notion of uh, of its free uh, as in a, a free kitten, um, and and by that I mean uh, sure somebody gave you a kitten, uh, but you have to pay for the food, you have to pay for the cat litter, you have to pay for the vet bills, uh, and so forth. Um, as as you talk with people outside the library community, in, in particular funders, or, or maybe even still in the library community, uh, do you encounter the notion that open source is better because it's free? And how do you convey the need for uh, real resources uh, for a project uh, when that, that notion of, oh, it's free, go for it? Uh, uh, comes into the conversation. So I, I guess I'll start again. <laughs> um, I don't really have much uh, talking experience outside the library. Uh, since I'm a developer originally, they don't let me out much. But from within the library, 
we really don't run into that mindset as much as we used to. Uh, I think open source and the participation in projects like Blacklight, Spotlight, you know, IIIF, all this stuff, there's so many initiatives out there that the libraries, you know, we know about them and we kind of know how they operate. Uh, but one of the, the other thing that's really helped the library and the customers for us is um, we, you know, do the agile methodology where everybody has to pay these imaginary points. And so that they, they kind of see this cost that's associated with working on these projects because they've all got these little imaginary points and they have to spend them. And when they run out of points, then we can't do any work. And so that mindset is kind of trickled out of the agile process into all these other, you know, open source projects to where it's like, look, if we need to do in folio, I mean, the whole thing is just agile. I mean, that's, uh, so you've got this whole, let's just say generation of, of librarians and people participating in folio that know it's just not free. There is a cost associated with it. So. Do you, I, do you, I'm wondering if, if, uh, if it, well, you, as you said, Doug, you're, you're not uh, allowed to, uh, uh, to talk <laughs> uh, with the, the uh, administrations. I don't know, Deb, if, if in, in your role, uh, you have to, to talk to funders and, and try to, to justify um, the, the resource allocations for things that are free. Uh, we do. Actually, our provost was very engaged in whether or not we were going to pursue an open source option for our library system because of that other thing that happened at Cornell with open source that didn't go so well that um, I won't, but it, it didn't go well, not at the library. And uh, so they were very hesitant about whether or not we would invest um, because we are investing dollars, a lot of people's time. And so our purpose was actually very engaged. We had to have lots of conversation, not, not me so much as our AUL and our university librarian, right? Um, making those connections. And we did negotiate for some capital funds when we needed to extend our go live for a year um, to wait for some additional development. And so that involved people from across the university so we have had to do a lot of and and we continue to justify why we're doing this spend and what i think it's a big you know initial investment that over time will pay off and we often say and i really hope this is true that this this might be our last ils implementation that we ever do because of how agile folio is right so it's this investment but folio will continue to grow and evolve over time and and change as the needs of libraries change and the services that libraries provide change and so we may never have to do this again and and i hope we don't i, I think it would be fantastic if that's how folio um, evolved because our last ILS implementation was 21 years ago. You know, we, we kept our current ILS for 21 years. And so we do have a question in, in the questions, if, if we want to touch on that. Yeah, so I, I wanted to give Mike a, a, a chance to chime sure. in here uh, about resourcing uh, before. But yes, uh, then I think we'll, we'll tackle some of these questions coming in on Q&A. Yeah, I think that uh, as Doug and Deborah have stated that, you know, people are increasingly, they recognize that open doesn't necessarily mean free or cheaper. But by the same token, I think one of the power, uh, the power of, of the, and the opportunity that we have ahead of us is that we're able to distribute the cost of creation across many different organizations. And so no one organization has to necessarily bear the the whole cost of creating a product or extending a feature. And there've been a number of examples where uh, institutions have partnered up in order to, to fund an activity, um, which has reduced their cost. So it's not free, but there is a, a, an, uh, an economy of scale here um, for creation and, and even um, hosting. So, you know, if we have, if people are thinking about Folio as a specific example of a system and they have to pay a provider because they don't have the technical resources to do that. You would think, I would think, we would think that uh, their overall total cost of ownership would probably go down as compared to a commercial vendor because 
the whoever they choose for hosting is not necessarily funding all of the development and maintenance and upkeep of all the software as well. So uh, there are some some benefits I would think to cost, but not free. But not free. Twenty one years is is a long time. Uh, uh, Todd Carpenter uh, from NISO in his uh, monthly newsletter that uh, came out this morning uh, has an article uh, or a, an editorial about uh, how one of the oldest systems on uh, North American library or campuses right now uh, is the library automation system. Uh, and so it, it uh, his, his uh, um, uh, editorial was kind of a call to arms for uh, improving the, the state of the art uh, in library technology. Uh, but uh, one of the questions that have come, come in is, is how do we as open source projects overcome what looks like a, a critical mass of Western and uh, European North American interests uh, overwhelming the needs in other parts of the world? Well, one way is to have an international presence in the project. And so Folio's had a number of contributors, uh, a very, very large, significant uh, set of contributions from uh, Europe, uh, Germany in particular, but also, you know, Knowledge Integration is one of the vendors that's working with the community uh, out of the UK. Shanghai Library has gone live, uh, obviously, in China. So, I mean, uh, that's the, to me, that's the part that you want to leverage is this international community um, to try to make sure that you account for um, all perspectives and not just have a North American centric perspective. So I think Mike said that eloquently. And the only thing that I would add is would be to, to lean in, to get involved, you know, to to participate in the SIGs and participate in the prioritization exercises. It's definitely a community environment. So get involved, let your voice be heard. Yeah, the, the world is just getting smaller each week, each month. And so Folio, we have worldwide participation. Some of the other projects I'm in, uh, again, just worldwide participation, which 10 years ago, it was un, unheard of. So that's my only. And cer certainly technologies like Zoom uh, make it easier. Uh, although as, as someone who has tried to uh, schedule a, a meeting from uh, uh, Israel uh, or participant in Egypt uh, to somebody in uh, California, um, that that synchronous time becomes uh, very hard to do. And, and uh, uh, as projects, I th we may need to find other ways to communicate and, and make decisions uh, that uh, uh, don't require uh, synchronous meetings. So here uh, is a, another good question about uh, how you balance uh, open source with other uh, uh, commercial solutions. Uh, the typical procurement process is, is very tailored towards commercial solutions. Um, any suggestions or, or your experience uh, in how to ensure open source solutions can uh, be put on an equitable plane, uh, equally assessed uh, during those kinds of procurement processes? Well, we took the time to write a project charter that outlined the soft costs as well as the hard costs so that we could use them when we were talking to procurement. We did choose to um, be hosted. So we actually did have, have hard costs for hosting costs and that actually helped us, I think. And then we had to articulate the staff time that we were putting towards this. Or, and we are also contributing some um, development and product owners to the community, what that time is costing us, that, that has helped us. We also have a governance process. So in addition to the purchasing process, we have a governance process for IT systems and IT security. And that was another really interesting area to try to navigate, trying to get the, you know, the IT security folks to um, approve <laughs> a system that's not built yet. You know, so we're 
because usually they it's a vendor application. You send the vendor a bunch of questions about it. They answer, it comes back, but there's no vendor to send a bunch of questions to, to, to get answered. So that's, but it, it's unique. It's unique and challenging. And as much as you can document and articulate, I think that helps. And certainly as, as projects uh, have, have faced the security question, but also the accessibility question, uh, when a, a procurement process uh, asks for a, a VPAT, a voluntary, uh, I've already, uh, I've forgotten what the PAT stands for, but that, uh, that, that uh, statement about how this system matches the, 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 uh, the requirements uh, for accessibility. And, and who's gonna answer that? Um, uh, so, so very much uh, like like security. Yeah, I think that there's there there are many differences uh, between uh, an open source project and and product like Folio and in other traditional uh, commercial systems. And so I think again, you know, creating some special processes or new processes around your procurement cycle, uh, being involved in the community and trying to understand. Uh, sort of what's going on and what the status is of the technology and, and the development process, I think also can be very, very helpful there. Um, and, you know, work with people that are flexible and can kind of adjust their responses to your requirements in terms of how you go about procuring technology or solutions. So related, uh, uh, Someone asks, how realistic is a, a solution like Folio or any other open source software uh, in an environment where it wouldn't be possible to create new positions uh, to support uh, or develop uh, the project? Uh, so this kind of ties into the uh, uh, procurement, uh, traditional procurement question as well. Uh, so, uh, we didn't create any positions. In fact, we lost a position during uh, this last year. We've also been on a hiring freeze. This is part of the reason why we chose a hosting partner. So if you have that ability, we chose a hosting partner. And I think Mike mentioned this before, if you don't have the resources to, to maintain what you're doing, it's not like we were turning our current ILS off and waiting a couple of years to, you know, to, to, to implement Folio, we had to keep everything operational while implementing. And I, I think you have to, you know, go through the exercise of weighing all of those things for yourself and what can you stop doing? Are there other areas where you could stop some development or stop some maintenance and reallocate those resources towards Folio, which is what we've been doing. It's a constant, we've been juggling our resources, our human resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say on some of these open source projects, you really cannot shortchange them or they're going to fail. They just you need to have some resources devoted to the project. Um, you know, and it, it it could be as simple, you know, like blacklight. I mean, you just need some expertise, either you develop it internally or you work with a, a, a hosting provider or someone else, or get heavily involved in the community. Uh, to, to learn, but, you know, open source, just like it's not free, uh, you do need to have someone that can care and feed it, you know, and know how to run it and use it. Um, and I've seen multiple times a project here in our library has failed because we shortchanged it. We did not put the resources that were needed. And uh, so, but they don't, all the resources don't have to be technical. They don't, you don't need a sysadmin or stuff. You can solve them other ways a lot of times. Our, our experience has been that the larger institutions definitely benefit and, and I guess would, would require uh, staff to be up on either the function, the functionality and the features and, and how they might um, map uh, folio into their environment. Uh, or technical resources that help uh, some on some of the periphery or even contribute development. But there are many 
uh, smaller institutions that actually don't have to add any resources. Um, it is, uh, for that, from, from their perspective, it's very much swapping out an old hosted system for a new hosted system. So it, for smaller institutions, it doesn't have to be that complicated is what we've seen. So a, a lot of our uh, discussion of, of barriers is uh, focused on resources and it's uh, introduce, it, it's interesting that, um, that we're focusing on that. Um, and one of the questions uh, from, from the audience is uh, about the abundance of uh, projects that a library can choose to get involved in. Uh, Blacklight, Vivo, Folio, IIIF, um, Viewfind, et cetera. Um, it, is there a limit to how many communities a library can be involved in? Or I guess just more general, how do you balance being involved broadly uh, in all of these projects that ultimately tie back to the services and the value that you're providing as an institution? Yeah, I'd like that answered for me. Um, <laughs> so we are involved in Blacklight, Vivo, Folio, IIIF, DSpace, and on and on. And, and I'd say we can only be involved in two of them at any good time, at any time with, with any real confidence, but it's a juggling act. So I, I don't know. We overcommit all the time. We're bad about that. Doug, do you, how do you uh, kind of going beyond the the uh, over committing process? How do you choose um, which few have your team's attention at any one time? Uh, well, we we have a process. We have uh, we have a project process that's very formal, and uh, theoretically, that's how resources are allocated. And we follow it probably 80% of the time. The other 20% is when the dean catches us in, catches us in the hallway and says, what about this? So, you know, we just try, in all this, we just try and be honest, you know, with ourselves. And that's part, the major problem is a lot of times the developers are not honest with themselves and uh, whether they can complete it or not. Um, but again, that's where the agile methodology has helped us. And we only we get in trouble when we deviate from that, when we deviate from our sprint schedules, when we deviate from sizing, from you know card creation, and we just lose track of everything we're working on. So, but it's not really just the developers. I mean, I'm going to say 50 percent. If you have a really good, if you have a really heavily involved customer who can has the time also to think about the project and the product and what they need and they come to the planning process prepared, that's a lot of peas. Uh, you know, it's very helpful, you know, so it's, it's not, it's, 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 there's a lot of synergy. So you need customers that are involved that are knowledgeable, you need developers that are knowledgeable. And so, and just be honest with yourself and don't overcommit. Um, I think that answer was excellent. The only thing I would add would be, I mean, I think so often that, um, we know we can do something, we don't stop and ask whether or not we should do something. And so taking just a little bit of time to decide what your, your strategy is, you know, what your you know, three to five year plan is, where you're trying to get to and whether or not these technologies support where you're going and then using that to help make decisions about where to invest your time. So this is a, a, a question that might be tailored uh, to Mike. Uh, we'll see uh, if Deborah or Doug want to chime in. Uh, is there a way to build in costs that hosting companies charge that goes back to dedicated uh, development for a project? Yeah, uh, that's actually something that um, has been discussed um within a community council uh membership model perspective 
as well as uh, by index data and, and maybe a couple other vendors. And that is, is there a model that makes sense where we essentially have a, a when we give a proposal to a prospect where we have sort of a line item that is the community fee. And so, you know, pick a, a random 5%, 10%, something like that, where there's sort of that item, that, that uh, amount of money would be sort of directed back to the to funding um, project effort. We, we as index data haven't done that specifically, although, as I said earlier, our whole company is built around services funding, open source development, and so it's sort of inherent, uh, inherent in all of our cost structures that anything that is above and beyond our costs is going to be used to fund open source development. But that is something that has been talked about, and to be honest, it, we didn't uh, in the discussions. It didn't go super super far because some of the vendors felt that it was probably a line that they didn't want to. It was a conversation they didn't want to start to have yet. Deborah and Doug, um, any reactions if, if a, a hosting uh, provider came to you and, and had a, a line item uh, that said, we're going to put these funds uh, back towards uh, uh, maintenance or feature development uh, for uh, the the system that is being hosted for you. Off the top, I mean, I have no initial objection to that. I mean, that'd be great because most of the time they want a developer. You know, sometimes you can only you solve things with money, and other times you can solve them with people. And people are a lot more sparse sometimes than money, so. I've not come across it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Doug. A lot of times we're asked for people and we, we don't have any more people to, to give. Mm. Um, I, so I'm, I'm noticing uh, we have about uh, seven minutes uh, left in the session. Um, so I think I'd like to ask uh, each of you to, to take a few minutes and uh, reflect on advice you would give to libraries uh, that are that are, are about uh, reducing barriers to adopting open source, uh, how to make uh, resource decisions uh, and uh, investment decisions uh, just based on your experience. Um, so I think I'm going to answer that um, in general. Uh, so my advice, recommendations for people starting into this is, uh, and Deb alluded to it, uh, don't deviate from the source code too much. So when you join these projects, it's very easy to make all these changes and, and do things that, uh, that your library needs. Uh, and eventually it will come back and, and, and get you. Uh, because you're going to want something out of the core product that you can no longer get because you've deviated so far. And so um, that's a, a lesson learned is if you're going to deviate from the main branch, make sure there's a really good reason to do that because you'll, it'll be a long time getting back to it. Um. I already said this, I'm going to say it again, though, get involved if you're if you're if it's folio that you're considering and want to implement, get involved, get involved in the SIGs, um, under, you know, understand it and contribute to the community, it, it really does help. And then I think it's working within your your own institution for not just buy in like, <laughs> but you know, training and involving as many people as you can who are going to be using the system in testing it and, and playing around with it. And how does this work? And does this work for us? And how might we want to do it? And we think we have all of these requirements that it looks like they're not there. But then when you really get in there and start trying to do it, I think Anya alluded to it earlier, where she said it's a it's an intuitive system. You know, getting in there and trying out folio and seeing how it works in folio and that you really often can do what you thought you couldn't do because you didn't see it articulated 
as a feature, but it's just called something else or it works in a different way in Folio. And so that's my last piece of advice, which I would tell anyone implementing any new system, which is understand how Folio works. And rather than trying to adapt Folio to the way you do things, see if you can adapt the way you do things to, way, to the way Folio works. Because it really was a community sourced um, and designed system. So there might be some efficiencies in there that you didn't think of or didn't think you could ever do because your old ILS couldn't do it. So just along with the open source, have an open mind. There you go, there you go, there, I'm done. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> along with well, an open source, have an open mind. Have yes. an open mind too. Well, okay. and, and to be open to, to new possibilities. And, yes. and you, you described this uh, and with open source, you can get involved. You're not just handed something. Um, you have the option of joining a, a SIG or uh, uh, making a feature request or uh, uh, testing something, triaging a bug. Um, you, you, you have, if, if the software is so critical to your mission, you have a chance to invest more of your organization into making sure that that software works for your mission. I, I Parting thoughts, Mike? I, I think that uh, the, the term barrier is, we have to put it in context because uh, really the it's a pretty low bar to, to participate in something like Folio because as I said, there's so many areas for people to contribute and understand and, and add to the community as well as take away um, some knowledge or some, some value. Um, but it's a, it's a diverse community. It's a strong community. And so I think that there are the other uh, advice I would have is to partner up with people. So find like institutions, like organizations and, um, and roll your sleeves up and get involved as, as Deborah said um and explore what you can do because as, as i said the barrier there's there's role there's many roles for uh, that need to be played and that are available for people to participate um the project has a lot of needs and so i think there's a, uh, there's really there's there's a small barrier um to contributing well that's a, a wonderful way to to send off uh this panel uh here at the the uh, close of of wolfcon uh, Deborah, Doug, and Mike, uh, thank you for sharing your experience and your hard-won uh, wisdom uh, with us today. Um, Beth, could you send us off, please? Yes. Um, so yes, just a final thank you to everyone who's been participating today. We had 813 total registrations. Fabulous. Um, and with, we had over 44. Uh, presenters during the past three days. So this has been really a community effort from um, ARC, GoKB, Folio, ReShare, uh, Viewfind. And so just um, many thanks to you all. Um, there will be a survey coming out to everyone um, to help us um, plan for our next uh, educational opportunities. Um, and if you complete it, you can enter into the chance to win a free t-shirt. Um, that will be coming out in an email uh, with um, a special video message um, from our communities, as well as um, a link to all of the sessions, uh, recordings that are available. Um, final thank yous, it's like rolling the credits uh, to uh, Kate Waldron, uh, Rachel Fadlin, uh, Stephanie Buck, Peter Murray, um, the um, the OLF Roundtable and the OLF um, Board of Directors. So thank you all so much for attending and uh, we'll hope to see you in Hamburg uh, in September of 2022. So thank you all. Bye-bye guys, take care. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.